We're going to go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone, both on campus and online. I am Dr. George Vigil, Director of Marketing and Administrative Operations within the College of Natural Sciences. I'm thrilled that you have joined the College of Natural Sciences speaking engagement featuring Dr. Catherine C. Thornton during Women's History Month and as a part of our Sherba lecture series. At this time, I invite the Dean of the College of Natural Sciences, Sastri G. Pantula, up to the podium. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Just want to make sure everybody's awake. <laughs> uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, sometimes um, there's an echo here. So uh, that's my point. <laughs> It's just uh, my dentist calling me. <laughs> so, okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you for all of you to be here, uh, faculty, staff, students, our president, Morales, and chief of staff, Brian Haddock. Uh, thank you for all for being here. Uh, today is both an honor and a privilege to introduce a remarkable individual whose stellar career has not only soared beyond the boundaries of planets, but has also significantly contributed to the enrichment of science and education here on Earth. We are here to celebrate the incredible journey and achievements of Dr. Catherine C. Thornton. You are in for a treat. And again, I don't mean the reception at three o'clock. You are here to have a conversation with truly a trailblazer as we celebrate the Women's History Month. Born in Montgomery, Alabama, Dr. Thornton never dreamed of being an astronaut as a child. And my understanding is that she only liked climbing trees and play in the dirt. Needless to say, her curiosity led her to develop also a passion for stars and led her to pursue a Bachelor of Science in Physics from Auburn University, followed by a master's and a PhD in physics from the University of Virginia. In 1984, Dr. Thornton joined NASA's astronaut corps, making the beginning of what we would be, what would be an extraordinary contribution to space exploration. Or her career as an astronaut, she flew on four space shuttle miss missions, STS-33, 49, 61, and 73, accumulating over 975 hours in space, roughly 41 days. Each of these missions contributed significantly to our understanding of space and demonstrated the potential of human ingenuity and determination. One of Dr. Thornton's most notable accomplishments came during the STS-61 mission the first Hubble Space Telescope servicing mission in December 1993. Her role in the mission was critical in correcting the Hubble's flawed vision, thereby enabling the telescope to capture the breathtaking images of the universe that have since captivated the world. This mission alone stands as a testament to human resolve and our relentless pursuit of knowledge. Beyond her contributions to space exploration, she has been a steadfast advocate for education, particularly in STEM. After retiring from NASA in 1996, she transitioned to academia, 
joined the faculty of the University of Virginia, beyond her stellar accomplishments as an astronaut and a physicist, she has been a passionate, passionate advocate for STEM education and mentorship. She has inspired countless students, particularly young women, to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, leaving an in indelible mark on the next generations of scientists and experts. I was so glad to see lots of students this afternoon at noon come and be excited and inspired by her. Dr. Thornton's dedication to her field has been recognized through numerous honors and awards, including the NASA Space Flight Medal and the NASA Distinguished Service Medal. In addition to her illustrious career with NASA, Dr. Thornton has made significant con contributions to academia as a distinguished professor. Our research in astrophysics and space exploration has advanced our understanding of the universe and paved the way for future discoveries. So let me close with some of her, I think, famous quotes from the space. When a tool she was using slipped from the grasp and began floating away with quick thinking and a touch of humor, she exclaimed over the radio, Houston, we have a problem with a screwdriver. In fact, she also said, in space, no one can hear another person. No one can hear you scream, but you, your crewmates can hear you laugh. She also said, the universe is full of magical things, patiently waiting for our wits to grow sharper. Her, ab her ability to handle unexpected challenges with grace and wit speaks volumes about her resilience and adaptability in the face of adversity. So ladies and gentlemen, it, please join me in welcoming a true pioneer and inspiring educator, trailblazer, and a distinguished scientist, Dr. C Catherine C. Thornton. I forgot this afternoon to introduce Dr. Carol Hood, <laughs> our interim associate dean. She will ask questions just to embarrass her mom. So with that, I'll turn things to Carol. Uh, but before I do that, I was supposed to give you uh, a bag of goodies. So uh, they told me that, that they don't bring the bag in there. <laughs> At least half the students in the audience knew me, so that was fine. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with, with what I think is the question people most um, ask and want to know. Uh, what surprised you about living and working in space, and how did you adapt to the unique challenges of being up in microgravity? Um, it, Newton's laws are alive and well in space. They work just as well there. In fact, they work better there, I think. But you don't always, it's the things that you don't, think about that surprise you. So for instance, on my first flight, I was supposed to deploy a satellite. And there's a whole panel of switches you do according to a checklist. And you get to the bottom one, the last one to deploy it. And it's lever locked. So you can't accidentally bump it and deploy when you don't want to. So you have to lift up on it and then pull it down. So I was um, ready to deploy the satellite. I had a, a little box strapped to my leg where I, we had a microphone. I had to push a button to key a microphone. So I pushed the button and I started the countdown. I got seven, six, five, four, three. And at three, it occurred to me, I can't pull this up unless I also push, react that force. I thought, oh man. So I let go of the mic and decided it was more important to deploy on time. So I did that, but it took quite a while to convince the ground that I um, actually did deploy on time. Because from their point of view, I just stopped counting at three. You know, what's, <laughs> what's wrong with her? What did she do? 
So that was one of the things. And, and the other thing that's, well, there's lots of things, but another one that's funny is, and it's a way to torture rookies, which is also a sport, is um, in the first night you get up there, you've done your whole day. Some people aren't feeling well and you're tired. Everybody wants to go to bed and you get to, you know, your regular bedtime routine, you're brushing your teeth. And it's a regular tube of toothpaste, regular toothbrush. You squirt it on, you Velcro your toothpaste over here. And, and, and guys will start brushing their teeth and, and all of a sudden their eyes get real big and they think, where am I going to spit? <laughs> and why didn't I think of that before right now? <laughs> and I can't ask anybody because I got a mouthful of foam. <laughs> but they always figure it out. All right. Um, so you completed many spacewalks during your time. Um, can you share a memorable moment in addition to the screwdriver quote um, or challenging situation that you encountered while working outside the spacecraft? Um, the most amazing visual that I will always remember is when we deployed the solar ray from the Hubble Space Telescope. So on the second spacewalk of that mission, my buddy Tom and I went out and our job was to change the solar rays, bring home the old ones and put on some new ones. And one of the old ones refused to roll up. It's kind of like a double window shade that gets pulled in like that. And, and about halfway in, it decided it wasn't going to go anymore. So we knew that we were going to have to throw it overboard because we had no way to bring it home. So I was uh, on the end of the mechanical arm and I was holding the solar ray which on earth weighed about 600 pounds, but up there you just manage it with fingertips. It was amazing. And my buddy Tom was um, disconnecting it from the telescope, which we wanted to do in darkness so we didn't break a hot connection. And then we wanted to let it go in daylight so we could see where it was going relative to us. So I was just hanging out on the end of the arm holding this solar ray. And um, when it was time to deploy, I just took my hands off it and it didn't go anywhere. I mean, just we were flying in formation with it with no relative motion. And then um, the arm operator pulled me back, and the pilot then fired the jets to separate the orbiter from the solar ray. And the jet plumes hit that thing, and it, it bent like this, and it started flapping. And it was, I'm guessing, maybe 20 feet on a side. You know, and it was a 40 foot long thing just doing this. And we happened to be over the deserts in the Middle East, over Saudi Arabia and um, the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden. And it was like this pterodactyl just cruising over those deserts. It was, it was mesmerizing. We hung out and looked at that for quite a while before we had to finally get back to work, do what we had to do. So it's Women's History Month. So there's a variety of events on campus throughout the, the month. Um, and um, as physicists, we have gone through an are in a field that's predominantly male dominated um, and the astronaut corps, um, absolutely so as well. So how did you overcome challenges and stereotypes to become an astronaut or even a physicist? And what advice do you have for people facing similar obstacles? Um, I grew up with brothers. And I think that's the one thing I didn't give my daughters as brothers so they could see, you know, that you guys aren't that mysterious. <laughs> You're not that complicated either, by the way. <laughs> um, and I was just one of the guys most of the time. And, and fortunately for me, the guys in general were, were really good guys who, you know, treated me as a colleague most of the time. Um, and you just, just deal with it. You know, I don't know what, what else to say to that. You just, you just sort of, you, you know you can do what they can do, and so you just go do it. And you might have to work a little harder, but you don't complain about it. You just do it and get, get it done. So along those same lines, um, working with your with your colleagues, uh, what insights can you offer regarding effective teamwork and a collaboration in these high pressure situations? Um, it's interesting. NASA would assign crews back in those days with not a lot of regard to um, you say the personalities same. or anything like that. They'd find the people that were best suited for the job at the time when it was sort of their turn in the rotation to get a flight. And, and most of the crews gelled really well, got along really well, because everybody knows what the mission is. Everybody knows what the goal is. Um, you may have differences of opinion of how to get to that goal. And we would have these meetings with our flight directors and, and flight team before a flight to, to develop flight rules. And flight rules mean... What do we do if this thing happens? So if this widget fails, it could involve a number of different systems. And so you could have 30 people who need to know about this and understand what the implications of this widget failing. And in real time, you can't do that. So these are all developed ahead of the flight. So you put together this big old thick book of flight rules. 
So during those meetings where we would hash out all of those, it would be, you know, knock down, drag out, scream at each other across the table. And then at the end of the day, you all go out and get a beer together because it's not personal. And so I think, I think teams that can focus on the goal um, more than anything else um, can work. Uh, there have been some crews that um, sort of dissolved at wheel stop. <laughs> they, they got through the mission, you know, they did what they had to do, the mission was complete, and then they did not like each other <laughs> and, and sort of exploded. But I was lucky. I loved all the guys I flew with. I'd fly with them again in a heartbeat. So I think um, having a common goal, everybody recognizing what the goal is, which sometimes isn't clear. We don't all have the same goals. But if we do, I think you can push toward it. Um, you can get a lot done as a team if you don't care who gets credit, which I know in academia that's not always possible because young scholars have to distinguish themselves as independent individuals. Um, but that's sort of the antithesis of putting together a team sometimes. So I don't know whether it's some compromised position in the middle there. Um, but yeah, if you can do those two things, I think you can be very effective as a team. I mean, one of the things that I remember was the sense of community that we had there. And, and this goes into the next question. So um, you raised a family uh, while actively participating in these missions. So how did you manage the work-life balance um, and what support systems were crucial for you during this time? Work-life balance, yeah. Um, the best I could. <laughs> I, mean, I promise you, I did the best I could. <laughs> Um, like every, it's not it's not unique to being an astronaut. Any profession where you have a, you know irregular hours and things you have to do, I and mean, it just it's hard. It's just really hard. Um, I asked for help. The a lot of the non-working mothers, God bless them all, you know, saved my butt and helped take care of things that I couldn't take care of. Um, there was a sense of community. It was more you know nothing I'd ever experienced before, but kind of like a military squadron life. You know, the group that I came in with, we came in as classes. So we were the class of 84, affectionately known as the maggots. Um, Which makes me a maggot baby. Yeah, she, called it. yeah she's a maggot baby. Yeah, that was lovely. Yeah. Thanks for that. You should be proud of that. Yeah. Sure. Uh, the newest one's called the flies. They descended from the maggots. <laughs> I read that the other day. Um, yeah, so there was one time when um, she cut her head open and we were in the emergency room getting her face stitched up. And uh, I had my other two kids in the in the waiting room there. So I, you know, do I spend my time in the examining room with my nine year olds getting her head stitched up, or out in the waiting room with the other two? And so I kept going back and forth. And I went out one time, and my um, next youngest one, who was probably seven at the time, was sitting there reading a book. She was fine, but my three year old was sticking her crayons in the electrical outlets. <laughs> and so I ended up calling the wife of one of my crewmates going, please, please come get my kids, rescue my kids. And, you know, she did in a heartbeat. So with that kind of camaraderie and family, I would not have survived without that. When I went down there, my husband stayed in Virginia, so I was a de facto single parent with a two-year-old. And um, we had to get flight hours in a T-38. And so um, there were two other geographic bachelors in my group at the time, and they were both pilots. And one would fly with me, and the other would babysit for me. <laughs> <laughs> I know without Frank and Mike, I, I wouldn't have made it that first year. I would have I would have had to bail out. I didn't know that Frank was geographically separated for a while. I just remember yes. the whole thing. Yeah. Anyway. Um uh, all right, so we'll get back to how you got here. So what inspired you to become an astronaut and how do you inspire people today to pursue careers in space exploration and science? I saw an announcement NASA was selecting the next group in 1983. I don't know that I would have seen it if I were not working for the Army because it was an Army message that came through. And it said, Army people do this. And, oh, yeah, you civilians, you can do maybe this. So I went off and I did maybe this. Um, I had no idea in a million years that they would pick me. In fact, I was 100% certain they would not. But until they said no, the dream was alive. And then when they said no, I was going to find another dream. You know, I can hold I can pass can uh, imagine the future however I want. Um, surprisingly enough, they called me a few months later and said, you want to come down for an interview? And I said, well, I got something going next week. Can it be the following week? I mean, <laughs> I truly was an idiot. I had no idea what I was getting into. 
Um, and I said, well, yeah, I think we can do that. So I went down there for a week-long um, interview process, which was primarily medical tests, and then a visit with a psychologist and psychiatrist and uh, the interview board. One of the questions, one of the head doctors asked me was, okay, if you're not selected this time, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to find something else. I don't know what I have for you next year. I don't have this year which might have been the right answer, but it's what, not what other people would have said because a lot of people come back year after year. Um, and then we, uh, one of the medical tests was um, they were looking for, for tendencies toward epilepsy or seizures. And what they did was they instrumented our head and then drugged us into sort of a half a sleep state, just almost asleep, and then startle you. And something in that transition is supposed to help them figure that out. I went directly from there to the interview board and I was stoned. <laughs> so I was quite talkative, <laughs> but I am normally not that way. So it was a very fluid interview. Um, and then, then they, um, they finished asking me questions and they said, do you have any questions for us? And, and I was thinking if I ever got my husband to move to Houston, I would never do this to him, to, to him again. So I'm trying to figure out, is this like a real lifetime career or is this sort of a short-term thing? So I said, uh, yeah, what do you do when you're 55 years old and you're too old to be an astronaut and you're too young for Social Security? And John Young, who walked on the moon, John Young, who was chair of the board, looked up with his glasses on the end of his nose. He said, I don't know, but I'll tell you next year. <laughs> I thought, okay, I'm out of here. <laughs> There's no way. I met interesting people. It was a it was a great adventure for a week. I met people that I was sure were going to be astronauts and um, went on home. And then about three or four months later, they called and said, hey, you want to come work for us? You want to be an astronaut? I go, can I think about it? <laughs> Once again, thinking of family considerations. And um, so I did go down there. I took my two-year-old. So I was a de facto single parent for a while, which made the flying and getting her out of daycare problematic. That's where my friends carried me. Um, so, so clearly, at least one of your kids has gone uh, into STEM. So, <laughs> exactly one. <laughs> uh, others have dabbled. Um, so, given your background in physics um, and 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 STEM in generals, how can students from diverse backgrounds be encouraged to pursue careers in STEM? And what initiatives can institutions take to foster this inclusivity? I think um, there's two ways you can get people into STEM. One is you start at a young age, like that young man over there, and you push them into it by programs and showing them that it's interesting and exciting. The other way is you pull them through with promises of interesting and fulfilling careers. So it can happen at both ends, and it has to happen at both ends. So industry needs to be pulling them. We need to be pushing them. Um, and, you know, I am living proof that anybody can do it. <laughs> So, you know, astronauts, these big he-men and all that, but no, they, they took me. So what, do you, what can you say? If I can do it, anybody can. So Sastry mentioned that after you retired from NASA, you went to become a professor at the University of Virginia. Um, and, and since then, you've done, since retiring from UVA, you've done other work as well, like chairwoman of the board of the Space Foundation. Um, how has your astronaut experience and your experiences since then uh, influenced your work in education and advocacy for space exploration? Um, you know, I think when you become an astronaut and you first put on that blue flight suit, you get way more credibility than you deserve. I mean, I was brand new. I was pretty sure the pointy end of the shuttle went up, and that was the extent of my knowledge. So I kept my mouth shut and my eyes open. Um, and I think that that's true sort of much throughout your career. You can you know, you get you get a platform that you can use. And so um, I tried to do it through the Space Foundation that has an education component in it. Um, I taught for 20 something years in engineering, not physics, even though I'm a physicist, card carrying physicist, you know, I've taught in engineering. Um, introduced them as much as I could to the space business, took some field trips down to the Kennedy Space Center and uh, converted a few of them. I have one former student who's a PhD now at JPL and some other places like that. Um, done lots of programs for kids. Sometimes you don't think you're doing any good because they're, you know, playing with their whatevers. But, but you know, there's one in there you're, you're touching. There's one you're touching. I was telling some young woman here earlier today that um, who's going into... Alyssa. Alyssa, going into teaching. Mm -hmm. that, that on my last mission, it was a science mission. So we had a 
space lab module in the cargo bay instead of satellites. There were uh, four scientists who would fly, including me, and then we had two training as backups. So we did a lot of our training away from home. We were at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. And so we would spend our evenings in, in the residence in hotel room, eating Chinese takeout and a few bottles of wine. And six of us one night got together and we started talking about how we got where we are. And every single one of us, it was a teacher that we could name. You know, and mine was um, a guy named Clyde Hester, who was a retired Air Force major. He taught chemistry and the next year he taught physics, so I had him for two years. And the only thing I can say, I mean, he, he's the one who got me into physics, for sure. And the only thing I can say about how he did it was he expected the same from, of, from me that he did from the guys. That was it. Mm -hmm. So um, it's important to get kids in the, in the teaching part of it to inspire students and then push them from this end and pull them through from the other. So um, I know some of your missions and, and other shuttle missions around them involved international partners, and that's become a much larger component of space, space exploration nowadays. Um, so what role can institutions like ours play in fostering some of these partnerships? International partnerships? Well, I mean, that's one of our, globalization is one of our strategic priorities right now. So um, what can you speak into how we might be able to assist in these wow. areas? That's a tough one. I believe that we wouldn't have a space station now if we didn't have international partners. Because after the Columbia accident, I think they would have shut down the program instantly. After Challenger, it was, okay, we're going to move on. And they built the, the last shuttle Endeavor from spare parts that they were hanging on to. But that wasn't going to happen again. And after Columbia, I think it would have been a total shutdown, except we had a commitment to our international partners to complete the space station. And I think it's... If we want to go forward to Mars in particular, but maybe the lunar program as well, I think we have to do that because there are going to be ebbs and flows in all of our economies and all of our politics and whatever. And when you know <laughs> we're acting like we don't want any part of it, then the other partners are going to pull us through and vice versa. So I really think we have to do that. Um, what you can do, I don't know, international students be more um, yeah, I mean, how can we inclusive? prepare our students maybe oh, for working for in this? Maybe that's a, another way to think about it. I think international travel is essential. I think, you know, we don't understand, we can't possibly understand other cultures or even our own with, unless we see something slightly different. Um, I went off to, I went off to Germany. I did a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics. And it's the first time I'd ever been out of the country back in a long time ago. And um, it, it was eye-opening to me that our major colleague there, who was a senior scientist at a national lab, had never owned a home. It's the American dream to own a home. And he said, well, in my family, it's been taken away from us twice in world wars. I don't want to spend my money going to Sri Lanka on vacation. I collect memories, whereas people can take things away from you. But wow, I never thought of it that way. Not that it's good or bad, or it's just different than the way we think. And that's true in so many dimensions that, you know, unless you've seen something different than the way we do it, you don't know there is another way or that there are alternatives. And I think that, you know, helps understand people. You get a chance to do that. And I guess most Americans will never have a passport or speak another language. Not that I do it well, but or at all now. But well, at least the English primary speakers won't speak another language, but... Yeah. Yeah. This is true. I, I take that back. Yeah, I think many I, of our students here do, but but yeah. Yes. And, and God bless all of you who are bilingual and tri trilingual. And yeah, I'm barely single lingual. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thinking about what space travel looks like right now, um, there's many more private companies uh, becoming involved. So how do you see this impacting future opportunities for public sector organizations like NASA and their partners? I think the commercialization stuff is amazing and that's pushing us forward. Absolutely. Um, SpaceX is now our only transportation to low Earth orbit in this country after depending on the Russians for, what, a dozen years, half dozen years. Um, NASA needs to turn over and is turning over low Earth orbit to commercial enterprises. The space station will cease to be funded probably around 2030 by NASA. Um, I don't know what they're going to do with it. They have to find a way to deep six it somewhere. They can't leave it up there. But it's, um, 
I don't think anyone will take over the space station, but commercial companies are building their own space stations right now. There's Axiom, who's um, attaching their modules to the International Space Station to get them started. And then when we close out the space station, they'll separate and become their own space station. There are at least two other companies or partnerships I know of that are in the process of designing and building their own space station. So this is now commercial. It belongs to everybody, commercial. That frees up NASA to go on and do other stuff, which is right now the moon. I hope we don't, well, I'm kind of, don't necessarily agree with the party line. And now that I'm no longer part of NASA, I'm entitled to my own opinion. Um, if we attempt to set up a permanent base on the moon, I don't think we'll go anywhere else for three generations, just like we've done in low Earth orbit. Our goal after Apollo was to establish a permanent presence in low Earth orbit, which we have done. We've had people in space for every single second of the last 24 years. I said, we're permanent presence. We're up there. And when NASA pulls out of it and pulls out of the space station, the commercial companies are going to be there. So it, we're permanently in low Earth orbit. But that's all we've done for the past 40 years, 50 years is go around the Earth over and over and over and over and over again. If we want to do something else um, besides going to the moon and establishing a permanent base, I think it's going to be like forever unless we um, go to the moon, have goals, you know, missions, things we need to do, things we need to learn, learn those things, pick up and move on. And I really would like to see people walk on Mars in my lifetime. I checked the Social Security life expectancy calculator, and my expiration date is 2039. July, to be exact, <laughs> and I want to see it happen before then. I I've given up the fact that I'm not going to be there, but I want to see somebody walk on there before I expire. So if you could help me with that, I'd appreciate it. I didn't need to know that countdown. <laughs> <laughs> um, and now I'm thinking about space NASCAR as well, the going over and over and over. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Elon put up a car. I mean, yes, yes, you did. <laughs> it's going around over and over and over again. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess along those lines, and you, you mentioned a little bit about this, um, where do you see humanity's future in space exploration going? And how can we ensure that everyone has equal access to these exciting new frontiers? Hmm. I, I think we're going out. We're going to Mars for sure. Uh, I can't see beyond that. You know, what's the next destination? Um, mining asteroids. There's there's potential there, not just for rare earth elements and things like that, but for um, Water or hydrogen, oxygen, which is breathing stuff. It's rocket fuel. It's it's um, it's a commodity that we pay a lot of money to launch from Earth to space. If you can find it in space, um, there's a there's a market for that. Once you get to low Earth orbit, you're like ninety percent of your way to anywhere in in the solar system, energy wise. You climb out of this deep gravity well that we live in. Um, I think that's a possibility. And how can we? What's the us? How can we ensure that everyone has equal access? Uh, so it's not just the billionaires that are playing their fun games with their sports cars in space. Um, well, I think the government programs are what does that. I think that um, you know Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos will do what they're going to do. And I actually am glad they're doing it. I think that that pushes everybody else forward. As far as you know, if you don't have a billion dollars, how do you get to fly? The cost is going to come down on uh, all the commercial. There are people like uh, Robert Bigelow who are planning to build a hotel. As soon as launch costs can get down to where some reasonable number of people can do it. Um, and not everybody is willing to, to fork out, you know, 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 to go fly in space, but there are plenty of people who would. There are people who fork out 100,000 to go climb Mount Everest and be miserable and die. <laughs> I mean, it's a much better deal, I think, if you get to come back. Um, so I think that I think the launch cost will come down as flights become more frequent. The reusability is an interesting point. I heard a talk years ago about why uh, Elon Musk is not using liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen in his rockets, which give you far more uh, specific impulse than the fuels he's using. And he said, well, once we get this thing reusable, the major cost of launch is going to be the fuel. And methane is way cheaper than liquid hydrogen. So he was thinking ahead to that point. And I think that it will get cheaper and people will get to do it. It's a serious commitment of their resources for most people, house or flying space. You know. But 
it'll happen, I think. Future family vacation? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, does anyone in the audience have any questions? I think we all have a mic coming around in just a minute. Yeah. Someone. Where's the mic? Potentially. Yeah. Mike. Yeah. The mic is for the Zoomies, yeah, by the way. People on Zoom, so we want to make sure. Uh, start back. Good afternoon. Uh, it's so good to meet you. I have a question related to health. Uh, so to astronauts, so I, I know that astronauts, I have read that astronauts experience bone loss and loss of strength. What did you do to take care of it? And did you actually experience any of uh, these bone loss when you came back? Did you get tested for it? My flights were relatively short. My longest was 16 days. So probably not a measurable amount of anything. I know on the longer duration flights on space station, they, they do a lot of exercise. They have uh, aerobic things. They also have resistive things so that they can work on that. The um, researchers are, are following that all the time. They do a longitudinal health study. So I go back once a year on invitational orders to do a complete physical, and they do DEXA scans and all that. But I'm probably more a control group uh, to compare to the ones who've been up there a lot longer. But yeah, bone loss is one, radiation is one. Um, damage to the optical nerve because of increased um, intracranial pressure and vision changes is another thing they're looking at. Um, immune system changes. That, I don't know if they're long-term changes or not, but. So yeah, they're they're trying to follow everybody who goes to space with um, long term long term surveillance. Thank you. After all the movies and televisions I watch, I always wanted to ask an astronaut, what, what does it feel, thought wise and just even physically, at the moment of few seconds of liftoff and reentry? I mean, is it really hot? Is it really painful? Is it really loud? What does and what goes through your mind? We have on um, our skull caps, our communication caps. And so, you know, it's not painfully loud. Um, liftoff is, is sort of like an unrelenting push on your back. It's not like somebody kicks you in the back. It just pushes. A lot of vibrations in the first stage when the solids were still burning. Um, after two minutes, they burned out, separated. And then it was um, more of an electric cart ride, sort of acceleration building up, but not a lot of vibrations. An interesting feeling, if you have the wherewithal and the wits to think about it, the time is is you're you're going upstairs upstairs you're going uphill we call it um, with the solid rockets burning and then they the engines shut off and they separate your acceleration vector goes from here to here briefly and then as you burn off fuel from the from the external tank then you turns around and goes this way again but there's a little while in there where this is not where we're supposed to be going <laughs> even though you understand it. And there, there are separation jets that push the solids away from the orbiter. And, and that was like, if you're on the flight deck and can see it, it was like being in the inside of a furnace. There's like fire in all windows briefly. That's another <gasps> moment that you know to expect, but still a little uh, nerve wracking. Acceleration built up to about three Gs toward the end of the flight, the end of the ascent. And that was limited by the aircraft. We had two wings and a tail and a tank and complicated aerodynamics going on in there. Um, and then when the main engines cut off, you go from from uh, this gorilla sitting on your chest to floating, like instantly. Now that they're flying capsules, streamlined capsules and not airplanes tied to rockets, um, they're doing more like four or five Gs on ascent. They're doing much more than we did. So it's a, it's not, I wouldn't say it's a rough ride, it's just more crushing. You have to work a little bit to breathe against it for some period of time. <clears throat> Deorbit, the gravity is really deceleration. So you do the deorbit burn, that, that changes your orbit so it comes down into the atmosphere. And then as you come into the atmosphere, um, you're slowing down. The atmosphere is getting denser and you're slowing down. And that's what you perceive as gravity is when you're doing that. So that comes on much more slowly. It feels really heavy. You feel a lot heavier than you really are until you get used to that. Oh, God, arms so heavy. Um, it... Um, it doesn't get terribly hot. It actually gets more hot after landing because the tiles absorb a lot of that. And then after you land, that heat sinks back into the orbiter. So it gets warmer after you've got after you're on the ground than it was when you're flying. 
Is that more a function of the tiles that you're landing either in Palmdale or? I think it's the tiles. Florida? It's the heat in the tiles coming in. Um, I was just wondering emotionally, how did you feel knowing like getting into the space spaceship or space shuttle? Like emotionally, what were you feeling as you were going up when you were in space settled? Um, how did you feel about knowing that you were away from your family and like emotionally, I just want to know like how'd you feel like as a human being in space and that's, not being in Earth anymore? That's that's a, that's a great question. We never felt separated from Earth. The, the typical shuttle and space station orbits, if you could shrink the Earth to the size of a basketball, are like a quarter to half an inch above the surface. Really, really close. We don't separate from the Earth like the guys that went to the moon. And that model, the moon would be about 30 feet away. So we're really close. We don't. I never felt separated from the Earth. And as far as launch, um, the hardest thing is saying goodbye to your family. And we would go into quarantine a week before flight. We were separated from our children who were infectious little beasts in contact with them were certain death. We could see our spouses who could be doctors who hang around with sick people for a living. And I never understood the logic of that, but I never broke quarantine. That was the rule, and I did it. But but once you do, once I did that, my thing was it was like watching myself do it. It's like being on autopilot, you know, just march forward and get it done. On my first flight, the shuttle never launched in the rain because it had all the tiles. They couldn't launch in the rain, and so it was. Um, it was raining when we went out to the launch pad. And I thought, we're not going anywhere today. We're going to strap in, lay on our back for five hours, and then we're going to come back and have lunch. And so at T minus 10, they said, we're going. <laughs> so I only had 10 minutes to worry about it. <laughs> um, but, you know, I never, some of my friends said, you know, if, if anybody says they weren't scared as lying, I swear to God, I was, I, maybe I was beyond scared, who knows, but I was just like a robot. I always thought that that quarantine was like vacation for you all. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the because one... once they got the cape, they got to sometimes stay at this beach house. And my dad would go to the beach house with my mom, and we got like stuck back in this hotel. Yeah. Well, one one good thing about it was that you know when you get ready to go on a trip, I, I never went on any trip at that time without pulling an all nighter the night before, getting everything done that had to be done. And so it separates you from you know uh, the lawn's got to be mowed, I got to pay the bills, you know, get all this stuff done. It separates that part of your life from the mission so then you could focus on the mission so there was there was certainly an advantage to it um, but all we could do in we would spend three days in Houston in a quarantine facility which was back back in the center by the gym and we really couldn't do much there and then we would go to Florida for the last three or four days and we could fly we could eat and we could jog or go to the beach house occasionally but that's yeah we couldn't go out to town or anything like that so it was a vacation. It may have sounded like this it. This was the kid's perspective. That yeah. My parents are off at a beach house, and I'm just sitting here to put on my thumb. Yeah. But you got to go to Disneyland. And when we when we delayed, when we got down there, and the family were all there, and then we slipped a day or slipped a day, slipped a day, they would get to go to Disneyland and uh, the beach and all that kind of stuff and meet all of my family that I didn't get to see because I was locked up. Yeah. Although I never, I, I tried. She launched, uh, landed, excuse me, twice at Edwards. Um, and I remember the first time, I think there may have been a delay for a landing for maybe it was, I don't know if it was the first time, but one of them. And I tried to convince my dad to take it uh, down here to Disney, right? Because we were just up at Palmdale. I was like, but it's uh, California. I didn't know any idea of how far away she was. <laughs> I just knew it was California. And I probably vaguely knew it was Southern California. Um, I think we got to go horseback right? So, so. Yeah something at least to keep the kids entertained so they're not trying to get away um they said that the first time that you see the earth you know from outside of it that it's a very okay, experience but obviously so are you getting up there for the first time and you're like uh, uh having some experience or were you not really able to take that in because you have a mission um on my first flight i was on the mid deck for launch i was the only one down there it was crew of five and my job when I uh, got to orbit was to put this little lock on the side hatch so we couldn't accidentally bump the lock open. And um, I bounced around that mid deck just for the longest time trying to collect the four pieces of this thing and then sort of marshal this cloud of stuff over here and put it on. And so it took me, 
I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, what normally would take me 30 seconds. And by that time I had bounced around a bunch and I was feeling kind of sick actually. Um, and so I finally get this stuff done and I, I looked up the hatch to the flight deck and then up through the overhead windows and I saw the earth for the first time and it was so bright. It just, it stunned me how bright it was. And then I threw up. <laughs> so that was my first impression. Um, but as far as, you know, people talk about the overview effect and all that kind of stuff. I, I expected to see a fragile earth and the blackness of space and all the things that I had been told. And honest to goodness, I did not see that. I saw a living, breathing, powerful earth. You think about plate tectonics, you fly over the, the Himalayas and you think those things are still being made by this fender bender between the continents and and uh, if you look out in the nighttime passes, you will see lightning somewhere. You'll see thunderstorms. You think about how much energy is in the atmosphere of the planet. And if you looked at where the sun was sort of glinting off the ocean, you could see that there's these chaotic currents all over the place down there. You think about all that energy tied up in this planet, that it's not fragile at all. We're the ones who are fragile. We can make this a place we can't live pretty easily. We're pretty fragile. But, you know, the cockroaches will be here and there'll be some other species who will thrive in whatever environment we choose to make. But I didn't see a fragile earth. I saw a fragile us. Oh, we've got two up here in the front. I was wondering for us, maybe commoners would be a, a good, uh, <laughs> right? No, seriously. Um, is there, because obviously none of us are going to experience what you've experienced, but is there a movie that you or your colleagues would say is relatively close to the truth maybe, or to your experience? I would say Apollo 13 is right on. I recognize some people in that movie they didn't even name by their personalities. You know, why is he so grumpy? Well, he's just grumpy. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I thought that was really right on. And the others are just in, are entertainment. Space Cowboys is one of my favorites. When they were getting ready to assign the crew for the last Hubble service mission, I tried to convince NASA, anybody that would talk to me, that they should assign the first Hubble crew to the last service mission. It would be like Space Cowboys meets the HST. It would have been hilarious. But I, I couldn't sell that. I tried. I was wondering, uh, have you done any work with the uh, Air Force research yet? AFRL? Um, no, I have not. Great research. Uh, mm -hmm. I was engaged at uh, Propulsion. Yeah. As you mentioned. And... Yeah, they do. Let's put it this way. <laughs> I'm happily retired, though. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. One more follow up on how does it feel? The, the uh, simulators that they have, how well does that simulate actually a gravity free environment that you train in? Um, there are different ways we simulate it, and every one of them lies to you in one way or another. <laughs> so the game is to do as many as you can and try to, in your mind, integrate that. So we do a lot of training in the water tank. And that allows you to do the choreography, basically. So there's a full-size airlock, and there's a full-size shuttle cargo bay, or now sta space station, and a full-size Hubble Space Telescope sticking out of the top of it. And so you move along on the handrails, and you know that you can reach this, and go through all the procedures. But there's still gravity. Tools are still heavy. Tethers hang down. Um, use the viscosity of the water to keep your rear end behind your front end, which does not happen when you get there. So if I'm moving up there with my hands on handrails, if I stop moving my hands, that's the only part of my body that stops. The rest goes, oh. <laughs> uh, so you learn you have to stop, and then you have to push back to react the torque and keep your rear end back there. Um, that's problematic if you're carrying something. <laughs> um, so you, you, it, it's, it lies to you that way. You can put on the water tank, you can put a power tool on a bolt, and you can spin it, and it's not going to spin you. But... Um, the hardest thing up, up there to do any kind of work is to establish a work site, is to get yourself in a foot restraint or some way so that you can actually use both hands to work and you're not using them as your feet to move. 
Um, what else? We used um, air bearing floor where you are the puck. It's like an um, air hockey game and you are the puck. But um, that, that doesn't give you all six degrees of freedom. So you can do this way, you can do this way, um, you can do a yaw, but you lose pitch, up and down, and roll. And you also use, lose how those couple with each other, which is a big deal. So on the second mission I was on, our job was to catch an, a communication satellite that was stuck in low, low Earth orbit, strap a new booster motor on it, and send it on its way. This thing was like 15 feet in diameter, I think. Uh, weighed several thousand pounds on Earth and was rotating because it was spin stabilized. And so the plan was to put a guy on the end of the mechanical arm with a capture bar and the commander would fly us right underneath that satellite and when it got to just the right orientation where he wasn't going to hit any rocket nozzles at the bottom, he was going to put that capture bar up and triggers were automatically going to fire and it was going to grab onto it. And... Um, that was a mistake, a huge mistake. And I think it was because we trusted our simulators and didn't do the analysis. So when he pushed it on, it didn't, the, the triggers didn't fire. And he ended up with, uh, you know, putting a force on it, which then coupled into the other axes and sort of put it in a flat spin that we couldn't chase. So we did that not once, but twice, two separate days. Finally, we decided the only way to get it was to send three guys out and grab it with their hands, which is what we did. We got satellite, we did what we had to do with it, but um, we trusted our simulators too much with that. Let's see, what else we do? Um, hmm? Oh, the centrifuge? I never did that one. It did, what that does is just give you G, but you you know, if you move your head, it uh, it causes really bad stuff to happen in there because you know, you, you're creating other forces on it in your semicircular canals. The reason that they were sending crews through that was um, after Challenger, we got these big orange launch and entry suits to give you the ability to bail out under some circumstances. And some people were coming back and saying they were uncomfortable when we got to three Gs. And so they decided, okay, we're gonna put you in the simulator. You can experience three Gs. And if your suit's uncomfortable, we'll figure out how to make it less uncomfortable. But by the time they started doing that, I already flown and I was okay with it. So I never did that. I think we're done. As we conclude our event, let us carry forward the inspiration and insights shared by Dr. Catherine C. Thornton. Her remarkable journey in the field of science serves as a beacon of empowerment and achievement for all. Let's continue to honor the contributions of women in STEM and strive to create an inclusive and equitable environment where everyone can thrive. Thank you to Dr. Catherine C. Thornton, Dr. Carol Hood, Dean Sashri C. Puntula, and the CNS staff for making this event possible. Thank you for joining us in this meaningful di dialogue and we will look forward to continuing the conversation in an ongoing pursuit of excellence within the College of Natural Sciences. There will be refreshments. And before we move over to refreshments, if everyone can please um, come to the front so that we may take a group photo. Thank you all.